You may be seated. It's like Nash and Steve know how to walk. They're pros. Walkers. Okay, good morning. to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. All right, so this morning we're just going to be covering the evidences of the resurrection. Evidences of the resurrection. Um, for the outline, we basically are covering three, three angles concerning the evidences. Um, we can see, obviously, scriptural evidence, physical evidence, and then evidence of believers changed lives. Ultimately, that's going to be somewhat more subjective. Uh, scriptural evidence is going to be the strongest of the evidences. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I would say a number of us are familiar here with this uh, passage. But this is Paul providing the argument for why the resurrection is actually valid. Uh, start reading in verse 1. It says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. And here's, he's got to recount to them what he had uh, preached to them. He says, For I delivered unto you first of all that which... Uh, I also received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then now he's going to give, this would fall under, um, I, well, technically this is scriptural evidence because it's uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, but he gives accounting of a number of the individuals who actually had seen Christ following his resurrection. And that he was seen of Cephas, who was Peter, then of the twelve, and then that he's, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once. Now, mind you, he, the folks that he mentions here are all believers, um, which we're going to be mindful of that fact later on and some of the other things that we're going to look at. Um, but he mentions, okay, there's 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Then after that, he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles. And then last of all, he was seen of me, also as of one born out of due time. And that would have been, when you go to Acts 9, when he was on the road to Damascus uh, as an unbeliever, seeking to uh, persecute the church, having um, permission basically from the high priest to be able to go ahead and round up Christians, take them back to Jerusalem and have them killed, uh, have them in prison as well. Uh, skip down to verse 12. And then he's going to present his argument. And pretty much 12 to the end of the book is going to be him arguing for uh, the veracity of the, of the resurrection. He says, Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there be no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and you, we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he, um, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead not uh, rise not. Okay. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain. Uh, he's repeating the same argument. Okay. And ye are yet in your sins. So here's the big significance. Well, good morning. We're in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Um, 
and then you're yet in your sins. Uh, verse 18, and then they also which are uh, fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in, this Christ, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Uh, and so the, the argument comes that if Christ isn't risen, then everything that you've believed to this point is basically false of demise, and you have no hope beyond what you have in this life. Good morning. Uh, and so if Christ isn't risen again, then you're, you're going to be you're going to you're going to die in your sins. There's nothing that can be done about your sin. Uh, you're going to perish. You're going to go basically go burn in hell. Uh, now most individuals uh, that would argue against the resurrection usually are not believing in God to begin with. But we know from Romans one that. Um, it's the ones that don't like to retain God in their knowledge that reject truth, that basically turn to lies, are the ones that are going to be rejecting God altogether. Um, oh, I can't do that. I was going to give you guys a... There we go. Oh, is that your last one? No, that's fine. No worries. Oh, you're fine. Not a problem, you're open. Because I didn't make enough. I didn't realize you were going to help them. <laughs> Big turnout. Hi, good morning, how are you? Uh, we are in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. Okay, so with regard to the resurrection of Christ, um, one of the evidences as far as what he gives beyond just as far as this is considered scriptural, the argumentation put forth is that if Christ isn't risen, risen from the dead, then uh, your faith is in vain you're going to perish when you die. Okay, now, unbelievers like to reject God uh, and then don't even want to acknowledge His existence, but you can't deny that because the fact is, beyond just the creation account, uh, beyond the fact that you have an internal knowledge, uh, you have Holy Spirit conviction, who's, uh, we're told in uh, John 14, 15, and 16 that He's going to convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So there's not going to be anybody that's going to be able to stand before God and point their finger and say, well, you never showed me or you never proved yourself to me. And you, you know, there's no quote-unquote evidence. Uh, and then we have the other uh, scriptural evidences. Go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27. Technically, it would start Matthew 28, but you have... Matthew 27, uh, starting verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, mind you, this is his death, and this is the only accounting that we have of this. Now, this is Matthew writing in particular to the Jews. Uh, if we uh, recall as far as the gospel accounts, they're all written by believers of Christ, and Matthew in particular was one of the apostles, uh, but his audience, as far as when he had written it, was particular uh, to, to, to the Jews, to Israel, because he was trying to write to them concerning Christ being... Messiah, King of the Jews, having come. And then we know Mark was written more towards uh, the Romans. Luke, um, more trying to prove that Christ was the Son of Man. And then also John was basically written to the general audience being so that we would believe. If you look at uh, John chapter 20 or uh, John chapter 21, actually John chapter uh, 20, when he writes that, you know, these things are written as far as that you may believe on the Son of God. Uh, but his audience being that uh, the Jews, there's a prophecy that Christ gives and also that uh, we are also told in Ephesians 5, uh, sorry, this is not necessarily prophecy, but after the fact, that he would lead captivity captive. And so those that would be considered in captivity would have been at this point in time uh, in what's called paradise. Now paradise is 
at that time would have been Abraham's bosom. Remember Luke 16, the rich man and Lazarus in hell. And so you have Abraham over here, and then you have rich man in hell over here. There's a great gulf between, and they are able to actually see each other, one to the other, but they can't cross over. You can't go over into hell, and then the other person can cross over, obviously, into heaven. He called out for Abraham to have Lazarus dip the tip of his finger into water, put a drop of water into his tongue to cool him and to uh, soothe him from the, the torment in which he was in. Uh, at that time, if you recall in John, not just in 14, 15, but also in 16, that he says to his disciples that uh, I go to prepare a place for you, uh, that there where I am you may be also. Um, the place for them being, it's not, all right, I know we, we sing songs about this, and we like to think of it as, okay, this is a, like an over 2,000 year building project that God's got going on, right? Uh, so you know, we got our mansion in heaven that we have um, his place being, in other words, the ability to be able to come in to God's presence, to be able to go into heaven now, made available to us because of the blood of Christ that he would shed. At that time, he had not shed it yet, but then he would, after, obviously, shed his blood, bring it upon the mercy seat over there in heaven, and then we now have direct access to God. And you see that with the veil being rent in between from top to bottom, where God's now no longer in the holy. So holy says, glory doesn't dwell there anymore, and now we have direct access to God. Um, so anyways, um, Okay, he brings about the fact that okay, these believers now in from Ephesians five, being uh, that they are not being able to go in uh, because they didn't have direct access. Now they are free from what was paradise, which was basically a holding place. I guess you could say kind of in a sense jail, but it's not really jail. It's good uh, because it wasn't. They weren't in torments but they were reserved until now they're able to go ahead and go in to be with God direct. Um, that way having been made available for us by the blood of Christ. So these are these individuals that risen, that we see that, that are here risen up. Uh, skip down to verse 1 of chapter 28. Okay, and the end of the Sabbath that began uh, to dawn toward the first day of the week. Okay, so this is first day of the week being Sunday. Okay, Mary Magdalene and the others, and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, and the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Okay, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And the fear of him, the keepers did shake and become as dead men. Now, mind you, um, we did skip over this, but... Uh, Verse 63 of chapter 27, um, the chief priests and the Pharisees had come to Pilate and they said, Sir, we remember that the deceiver said that while he was yet alive after three days, I will rise again. Command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure, in other words, that it be secured, that it would be guarded uh, 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 by Roman soldiers, so that uh, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, He is risen from the dead, so that the last error shall be worse than the first. Okay, and then Pilate said unto them, you shall have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as you can. Uh, so they went and made the sepulchre sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. And then now we see that the angel came down, there was a great earthquake. He rose away of the stone himself, and the witnesses were the actual guards, who, mind you, um, by threat of their life, in other words, if Somebody would have come that actually had, had the ability to roll away the stone uh, of, of natural means. Uh, they would have, one, been killed, certainly confronted uh, on that account. And if they would have gotten through to be able to get the, the guards, the guards weren't somebody that you would pay off necessarily because uh, they answer to their higher-ups and they would be something that... Uh, are basically under threat of their life. In other words, if what we're guarding is gone, when we give account of that, you know, our lives are going to be taken in exchange for that 
of which, of, of which we were guarding. So it wasn't anything that um, would have been, oh well, as, as well, we'll see the accounting. Go to verse 11 of chapter 28. And then when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money to the soldiers, uh, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. In other words, here's the story that you're going to give. Even though you would die, we're gonna we're gonna make sure that you will pay them off as well, so that uh, you guys aren't killed. Okay, so that's that's what he's talking about as far as the securing you. So they took the money and did as they were taught, and this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day that basically Jesus' body was stolen, uh, despite the fact that uh, they would have to risk their lives, giving their lives for that to be the case. And even though, in the face of a supernatural event, which literally the angel of the Lord came down, rolled away the stone, great earthquake, uh, his countenance was as lightning and his raiment white as snow, uh, as the scripture says. Go to Mark 15. Well, Mark 16. It's going to it's going to be all the same accounting, basically. Mark 16. And then when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and uh, Mary the mother. James and Salome had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun, and when and they said among themselves, Who shall roll away, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. In other words, the rolling of the way of the stone happened before they actually arrived, but it would have been in the presence of the actual guards. Um, according to Matthew. Uh, so by the time they would have gotten there, the guards would have been there as dead men, but the stone would have already been rolled away. Okay, and then entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white raiment, and they were affrighted. And he said unto them, Be not affrighted, and ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples. And Peter... Uh, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There you shall see him, and as he uh, had said unto you, and they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. And then, skip down to verse 11. Mary Magdalene is going to be the one that goes back and tells them of what they had seen, uh, and then this is the, the, the brethren. Uh, and they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. Uh, after that he appeared in another form unto two of them, this is Luke's accounting, Wait, what he's mentioning here as far as the, the ones that were walking to the road of Emmaus, as they walked and went into the country, and they uh, went and told it unto the re residue, neither believed they them. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Uh, and this would have been accounting also as well as when you have, uh, quote unquote, doubting Thomas, when Thomas says that, um, you know, my Lord and my God, or he initially says that unless I should put my nails and uh, my finger in, into, the, into his side and into the print of his nails, you know, then I'll believe. And then Jesus appears to him and says, okay, here's my hands, you know, go ahead and put them through, and then here's my side. And then that, when, that's when uh, um, Thomas cries out, my Lord and my God. And then Jesus says that, uh, blessed are those that say not that they believe. Uh, go to Luke 24, Luke 24. Okay, 
you know, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they rolled, and they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. They entered it and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed there about, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered to the hands of the sinful men, and be crucified on the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and uh, returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven, and all the rest. And uh, here it's the naming of the individuals that were there. Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. Uh, and then their words seemed to them, as, as to the apostles and the other brethren, as idle tales, and they believed them not. Okay, then rose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes, laid by themselves, and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Skip down to... Skip down to verse 21. Okay, now at, at this point, starting verse 13, he's going to deal with the two individuals that are walking to Emmaus. They didn't originally acknowledge that this was Christ that was with them, but he asks them concerning their countenance, why they're sad, and then they tell him, oh, you know, are you not, are you but a stranger yet in, in Jerusalem? Have you not heard? And um, that, that's where, where we pick up here. Um, verse 21, but we trusted that it had been uh, he which should have redeemed Israel, and beside all this, today is the third day since these things were done. Yea, and certain women also of our company made us astonished, which were early at the sepulchre, and when they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said that he was alive. And certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre, and found it even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. And when he said unto them, O fools and slow of hearts to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And then beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures things concerning himself. Okay, and they drew nigh to the village, and whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break and gave to them. Their eyes were open, and he knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Okay, and then they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures? Okay, so another accounting. Now, this is interesting also that he mentions that it's the scriptures in particular that bring about uh, the convincement. It's the Holy Spirit through the scriptures, obviously, but it's the scriptures in which it was written concerning him that he would suffer, that he would die, and particularly that he would rise again. Um, go to John 20, and then John 20. Skip down to verse 19, because the accounting is going to be pretty much the same. Okay, the first day of the week, cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark, and then so we have the same accounting. And then uh, verse 19, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side, uh, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father had sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed unto them, uh, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Uh, verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, or the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto them, 
have seen, or we have seen the Lord, but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the point of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Okay? Now, I know, I know this thing's kind of silly. We're, we're going to bring up this point. Um, was it possible for Thomas to believe? Was that necessary for him to have, to, to have that to be the case? In other words, was it necessary for him to have Jesus there physically to be able to stick his hands into the print and, and, and to his side? Was that necessary for him to have that be the case for him to believe? Maybe for him. Say again? No. Yeah, no. No, it wasn't. In other words, he didn't have to have that. I mean, that was a choice that he made. He's like, okay, God, you got to prove yourself to me. Uh, but it wasn't absolutely necessary for him to have that be the case. Well, we'll see that. Um, and then after eight days again, his disciples were with in, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And then Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Okay, and then many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. Okay, now this is just a small sampling. Obviously these are the actual accounting of it within the Gospels, but this is a small sampling. You go through literally every single book in the New Testament and countless times uh, you have recounted of not just the resurrection account, but also uh, referencing back into uh, Old Testament Hebrew scripture with regard to the fact that Jesus was to rise again, not just particularly to suffer, that he was cut off for his people. That is a main focus uh, because of the payment for sin, but the fact is, um, you know, he would not he would not leave his soul in hell, um, and that uh, so that you know Christ was to rise again uh, from the dead. Uh, the scriptural evidence. Uh, from there, we would jump to what would be the physical evidence. The physical evidence. Now, um, okay, that and then the, the believers changed lives. I'm going to touch upon a little bit more and. The scriptural evidence is going to be our foundation. Anything and everything that we come to know about Christ and that we would believe and that we would have faith in is because of what's written in the scriptures because it's God's word. And then that's pretty much um, reinforced by the Holy Spirit's conviction in our hearts. But it's it's because what's God, what God has given us in his word is why we would know. Uh, beyond that, physical evidence. What physical evidence do we have of the fact that Jesus actually rose again from the dead? This is an easy one. <laughs> no body. Say again? No body. No body. What else? The empty tomb. Okay, I mean, I guess it kind of goes hand in hand. You got, the, yeah, you got no body, and then you got the empty tomb. All right. You could go through uh, pretty much any quote unquote world religion that you would want to think of, and the founder of it is going to have their bones, you know, in a grave somewhere. Uh, you could have, actually he would have been in Medina, but they would have transported to Mecca, but you would have Muhammad in Mecca. And then you would have um, Buddha in India, and then you would have uh, any other number of individuals. Uh, Joseph Smith was put to death. But I mean, none of these guys were <coughs> supernatural. They never did anything supernatural. Uh, distinction being here that Jesus is actually literally God, um, but we have no body, and we have a grave where he was laying with obviously no body, it's empty. So you have the physical evidence. Um, the scriptural evidence corroborates the fact that when he presented himself in 1 Corinthians, it was to brethren. Now you have the resurrected individuals that came out whenever he died, and then the, uh, the veil was rent in twain, uh, those that were in captivity, that were <coughs> captive, and then now they're free from paradise. 
before they go ahead and they go on to be taken up. Um, but they came about and then they walked around in Jerusalem that we recall Matthew's accounting. Uh, those individuals would have gone and testified, hey, you know, we're alive and this is real. But in Paul's accounting in 1 Corinthians 15, if you recall, when he presented himself, it was always to the brethren. It was always to the believers. He never actually presented himself with the exception of, as far as historical accounting that we could see uh, from Scripture, with the exception of Paul, when he presented himself at the road to Damascus as a bright light, and then he speaks to him directly. And then Paul gets converted right there at the, at the road to Damascus. Um, you don't see him presenting himself as a as to, as, uh, to the world, to the unbelievers. Uh, and then you have, beyond that, the evidence of believers change lives. And that being the apostles in particular, the 12, you have the disciples. And then obviously, uh, for those of us that are here this morning that are born again, us. The apostles in particular, go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. <coughs> Actually, you know what? We'll go back to John chapter 20. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Sorry. They immediately had not been believing. When the women had come back from the grave, they came back. And we read specifically, it says, they were astonished. I mean, yeah, obviously, it was, it's an amazing thing. Uh, and it says specifically that they, they didn't believe. It seemed as idle tales to them. Um, and Jesus rebukes them for that, for their unbelief. And then he calls the, the two women, in particular on the road to Emmaus, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe. Uh, but John chapter 21, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And on this wise showed he himself. Uh, they were together, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, who the twin. And then uh, Nathan, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee, uh, James and John, and uh, two other of his disciples, Simon Peter, saith unto him, I go fishing. They were, uh, they say unto him, we also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night they caught nothing. So then Jesus is going to come to them. He's going to you know, ask them, you know, have you any meat? Uh, and then he tells them where to put the net, where to cast the net, on which side, and then they kept such a great drop that it's breaking the net. Uh, they realize this is the Lord. Peter jumps down to go swim to the shore. They go to meet him. Jesus already has a meal prepared for them. And then skip down to uh, the 15th. Okay, so when they had dined, Jesus saith, Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Okay, he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Uh, and he's, he's going to repeat that two more times. And go down to verse 18. It's the very I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and shall and another shall gird thee and carry thee be whither thou wouldest not. Okay, this spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, Follow me. Okay, and then well, Peter turns around, sees John, and then he asks, Okay, what about him? He says, Well, if I, if I will that he lives to when I come back, what's that to you? You know, I want you to follow me. So we see here, he's a little reluctant. To, even though he's glad at the fact that, you know, Jesus is alive, and he's there. He's a little reluctant to want to, you know, follow what God God has for him. Go to Acts one, Acts one. Um, skip down to verse fifteen. Oh, excuse me. Skip down to verse thirteen. Okay. And when they were come in, uh, they went into an upper room. Uh, well, verse twelve. I said they they. Then returned they unto Jerusalem uh, from Mount Cod Olivet, which is a which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Okay, when they were come in, they went in into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, 
Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. And then these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. Okay, and, then, and so following this, they're going to go ahead and cast lots for the replacement for Judas. And uh, verse, or verse 1 of chapter 2. Okay, and then when the day of Pentecost was come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and they appeared unto them cloven tongues as a like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. Uh, and now it's going to name off the, the, the languages and the places where the individuals that were gathered there. At, for Pentecost were from. Uh, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and saith unto them, You men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known be this known unto you and hearken unto my word. So now he's going to preach to them. Skip down to verse 36. Okay, therefore let all the house of Israel, and I'm skipping the whole message at some point and reading the whole thing. It's pretty lengthy. But it's, it's not to the point that, okay, can then let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Okay? So now, mind you, he's preaching to the individuals that actually were responsible for Jesus being put to death. Um, he's basically just calling him out. The one whom you personally are responsible for having seen to be crucified God had made both Lord and Christ, in other words, he's Messiah, and he had risen from the dead. And here's the effect of his preaching. Okay, now when they, the crowd, had heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter uh, and unto the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of, Lord, uh, of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, we can go through the, uh, I won't do this, but we're gonna go, we can go through the entire book of Acts, and see uh, accounting of accounting after accounting after accounting of you got Peter in particular with James uh, they're beaten they're put to prison they're threatened with their lives you know they're 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 threatened to be killed and they don't have fear in other words they count they a lot of times they actually count it as something to be joyful about that they were threatened and that they were actually persecuted for Christ um, if you recall. Whenever we didn't go over this, but whenever whenever Christ was actually taken, uh, the night that he was betrayed by Judas, and then you got the council in the evening, um, Peter was asked three times by a maiden that was there, you know, aren't you a follower of him? Aren't you a follower? And then he denied him three times, and in particular, the last time he cursed, saying, I, I know not this man. And then he goes off and. He's not really believing, even though he sees, okay, there's no body here. And he's heard the accounting of Mary Magdalene and the others that have come. And then Jesus obviously presents himself, even after the fact that he presents himself at the Sea of Tiberias, whenever they go back to fishing. And then he calls them out and says, you know, if you, if you, you know, um, I want you to feed my sheep. Uh, what would cause somebody to have that kind of mentality changed? I mean, just the reality, the convincement of the fact, okay, this is real. All right, no, one, uh, no one's going to believe a lie. No one's going to sit here and want to give their life for a lie. Uh, Jesus specifically told them, we, not, not everybody has this privilege, um, but specifically told them how you're going to die. <laughs> okay, if we were to go to First Peter, he tells them, you know, my time is short at hand, whenever he's writing at, at his second account, his second um, epistle, a second journal epistle, and then um, he specifically knows, okay, I'm going to die. Uh, Paul would know the same thing, and Paul uh, suffered great persecution. A number of the believers would end up being the only one that we know of that would die, I guess you could say, quote unquote, a natural death, uh, would have been John. But prior to that, he would have been boiled in oil. But every every one of the apostles themselves was uh, martyred. Uh, they, were, they were killed violently uh, for the name of Christ. And you have countless believers through the ages. Even now, in our day and age, uh, we don't see it very much in, in our country. Uh, though the climate towards Christianity is getting a lot more aggressive. 
Uh, uh, but there's believers in um, obviously Muslim dominated countries. You go to Pakistan or the Middle East, um, or even other, uh, like if you go uh, certain places in Southeast Asia, that they're, they're being you know, run out, houses burned down, um, being starved, attacked, killed, uh, just for just for believing in Christ. You know, they're not even, there's nothing violent on them. <laughs> they want to see people come to know Christ. And what would cause somebody to want to live like that? You know, why would somebody live like that, or, you know, if it weren't true? A skeptic would argue, oh my God, I don't have a lot of time for this, A skeptic would argue, you know, there's no evidence whatsoever. I have two articles I wanted to quickly quote from, and then I had a video that I wanted to partially play. I'll, I'll just play the video. Um, any of y'all ever seen a film called Expelled? No intelligence allowed? Okay, it's a film that's kind of like a documentary about a uh, movement called um, Intelligent Design. It's, it's kind of a, it doesn't go far enough with their argument against evolution. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's kind of a cop out to say that, hey, it doesn't, it, you know, they don't acknowledge a creator. Um, Richard Dawkins is this, I guess, you can call it fam, uh, famous atheist, basically, uh, wrote a book called God Delusion. In the film, okay. In the film, at the end of the film, he is questioned by the gentleman that is making the documentary, a gentleman by the name of Ben Stein, and he asks him a series of questions that he kind of just laughs at and scoffs at and says, no, of course not. He asks him, okay, you know, just to be short, um, he asks him, okay, does the God of the Bible, the God of the, the, the Jewish nation, the God of Israel, is he real? He's like, no, that would go, I go, go against everything that I've taught or believed. You know, so obviously you don't believe in the Hindu gods, or you don't believe in, and he goes off naming a number of different things, and he goes, no, 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 obviously no. And then so he presents to him a question, and he says, well, what if, you know, what if, you know, let's say for the hypothetical, what if God, and, and then so when he starts asking that, he's already a kind of adamant and standoffish, well, you know, that's not real, that's not really going to happen. Well, you know, let's just, let's just, let's just pretend to say that we're the case. Why is it that, um, you know, what would you tell God? You know, he's given you, a, you know, a million dollar the paycheck multiple times over through the, through, you know, the, through the medium of your books that you've written. And then, uh, you know, you, you've had a nice healthy life so far. And he asked, you know, why, why, why haven't you believed? And then he quotes uh, some fa famous skeptic, basically, you know, why did you make it so difficult to, to find you? Uh, that's not a verbatim quote, but basically, in other words, he's saying, you know, why is it that there's basically no evidence to the fact that you know you really existed. Now, the reason I mention that is because we have scriptural evidence, we have obviously the physical evidence, and we have the evidence of the believers. But ultimately, at the end of the day, belief and unbelief are choices of the will. I mean, all belief and unbelief ultimately require faith. Okay, so whether you want to be a skeptic, an unbeliever, you have to have to exercise that much more faith in, in what you are trusting in uh, than a believer would. Because um, you have to discount creation and then you obviously have to turn away from truth and you would have to discount the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart beyond just the actual evidence that we have from scripture and physically. And you can call it subjective because to some, some, some degree it is, but uh, you can't argue the, and deny the fact that, okay, there are people that believe in God that die for him. Okay, now, obviously, we haven't been to heaven. <laughs> he has. Um, but the only way you come to God is by faith. You know, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he's a reward of them that diligently seek him. And so, our faith stand its sure. In other words, our belief system stand its sure uh, in the resurrection of Christ, uh, primarily because he doesn't lie. He's kept his word, and his Holy Spirit uh, obviously convinces us that it's true. Uh, okay. I don't yeah, you're way over time. Yeah. <laughs> so we're dismissed. <laughs>